Today on Better in Our Backyard, we'll be featuring Congressman Tom Tiffany of Wisconsin 7th District. Before serving in Congress, Congressman Tiffany served in both the Wisconsin State Assembly and the Wisconsin State Senate and has a long history of being an advocate for mining in northern Wisconsin. During my interview with Congressman Tiffany, we discussed a little bit about his experiences serving in the Wisconsin State Legislature and some of the key work that he did in rewriting some mining laws for the state of Wisconsin. Wisconsin's mining history and the role that mining could play in Wisconsin's economic future, the Flambeau Mine, and lastly we talk a little bit about why it's so crucial for the U.S. to start securing domestic supply chains of critical minerals now for U.S. national security purposes and also for the growing renewable energy industry. So thank you to Congressman Tiffany for doing the interview. I enjoyed our discussion and I hope everyone enjoys this segment. You're talking about having to rewrite some mining laws in Wisconsin. Did you want to, did you want, during your time, I, I don't know if it was during when you're in the state assembly or the state senate, but, um, you know, can you touch on that a little bit? Yeah, I served in the state legislature, came in in uh, 2010, that election when Governor Walker was also elected in Wisconsin and uh, a number of reforms that we put in place in Wisconsin. And one of the things that I found out early on um, was that our mining law is really restrictive in the state of Wisconsin, including the moratorium that we had on, um, on non-ferrous mining. But we decided to split um, our mining efforts uh, from into ferrous and non-ferrous mining. And um, uh, the iron mining, I thought for good reason, because there's not the same environmental impacts. And so we were able to pass that and that was accomplished in my first term in the state Senate. I served in the assembly for two years, 2011, 2012, really got to know the mining issue during that period of time. And then one of the first things we did when I came into the state Senate is I authored the change in regards to the iron mining law. And we were able to accomplish that. Unfortunately, we've not been able to open that Gogebic uh, range project that is just uh, west of Hurley, between Hurley and Ashland one of the biggest deposits left in North America that is untapped. And then uh, we re I rewrote the um, non-ferrous law in, what would have that been, 2017, 2016, 17, um, after I was reelected to the Senate in 2016, then we rewrote uh, the balance of the mining law because we had a mining moratorium in place that was put in place in the late 1990s. And I don't believe that anything that can be legally done, not just mining, but there should be a permitting process. And that's all we did is we rewrote, uh, so we ended the moratorium and then uh, put in place a permitting process that was really tough, but that a company could na uh, navigate if they chose to want to open a mine in Wisconsin. And the other thing that we did, I thought there were two things. It was very protective of the environment, strong regulations in there, and the second thing is we allowed for local control. We made sure that local communities will have a say if there's going to be a mine built in their backyard. And so given, given um, your work at, in the state assembly and the, in the state legislator and, and helping with ending the moratorium on mining, do you see mining playing a, a big role in North uh, Wisconsin's economy in the future? I believe it can. You know, Wisconsin, um, we have a miner on our flag. There's a reason why we're called the Badgers. And it's not just because we have Badgers in Wisconsin. It's because uh, back uh, in the 1800s, even before statehood, there would be people mining in southwestern Wisconsin. And they would stay in those mines, in those pits, and they were re uh, called Badgers as a result of that. That's how we got our nickname is as the Wisconsin Badgers is because of mining that was done here um, over 150 years ago. And uh, we have a miner on the flag also. We have a long, proud mining tradition in Wisconsin that really has been stopped now as of, um, as of the late 1990s. The final project that was um, really conducted in Wisconsin was the Ladysmith Mine Project in Ladysmith, Wisconsin. And uh, that's really the last mine that was operating here. But otherwise, we have a long history of mining here in Wisconsin that's brought good jobs and prosperity to people um, who have uh, been involved with them. And we have significant deposits here in northern Wisconsin 
uh, no different than you have in northern Minnesota or Michigan. It's all part of that same complex of minerals that are available um, running all the way from the upper peninsula of Michigan over to the Iron Range in Minnesota. So you, so you mentioned about the last mining project. I'm, I'm assuming you're referring to uh, the Flambeau mine. Um, and it was mainly a copper mine in Lady of Smith, Wisconsin. Um, I believe it ran for four or five years, um, or it was in operations, excuse me, for four or five years. Um, here, here in Duluth and, and up on Iron Range, we hear a lot of the opposition talk about the Flambeau mine being borderline an environmental disaster to Wisconsin and, and, not, and, and not really being um, a positive for Wisconsin. Uh, what would you say to that? Is there any truth to the, the Flambeau mine being destructive to, to Wisconsin's environment? Yeah, that is a mischaracterization of the Flambeau mine. So you're correct. It was in operation for about four or five years. Um, the um, uh, very good for the United States of America, producing a lot of copper, as you mentioned. There's also gold in there. And you know, when you look at deposits generally here in northern Wisconsin, you go along that Highway 8 corridor, there are billions of dollars of recoverable minerals that are up here, copper, silver, gold, um, other minerals that are up here that um, could be mined and they could be mined safely. And actually the Flambeau mine was run safely. In fact, it could have been mined a little bit more. It was unfortunate that they did not completely mine that site. And I don't know if our listeners realize this, Canada has a law against that. Canada has a law against incompletely mining a particular deposit. And there's a good reason for that because it forces, um, it forces companies to do more projects. It's better in their estimation in Canada, let's fully mine the deposits that we discover rather than just taking some out and then doing, um, creating more holes in the ground. But back to Flambeau, it was successfully mined and what the opponents are referring to is stream C. And they point out that it's a very small stream that enters the Flambeau River. And they say that the um, background levels of um, uh, some contaminants exceed the requirements under Wisconsin state law. What they fail to say is that the, the amount of what they call contaminants that are in stream C are actually lower than upstream on the Flambeau River. So uh, when people really study that closely, and it's uh, not uncommon by the opponents to throw something like that out there without context, when you understand it within the context of what has happened there, um, Stream C is not polluting the Flambeau River. And what I always say to people, don't take my word for it. Go talk to the city administrator over in Ladysmith. He was there when the project was originally started and he went through the whole permitting process and is still there now. And he will say to you, that mine was mined safely and the Flambeau River is still a terrific, clean river that is um, a real asset to all of us in Northern Wisconsin. I, you know, and it's perfect that you mentioned that, uh, Congressman, um, because we, we actually interviewed him three, four months ago, his name's Al Christensen Sr. And Al he's like, he, he even made a joke when he was talking about the environmental impacts in the local area. He's like, yeah, I could drop a penny maybe in the stream and there'll be higher copper content in the water. You yeah. know, he's like, basically that's, you know, with, like what you said, there's no context to it. And they're, you know, they're just blowing things out of proportion. So I think, you know, Ryan, it, it's really important. I understand that there is real risk when you mine. But that's why we wrote our law the way we did. And I think Michigan and Minnesota are very much in the same place. Like when Michigan, they rewrote their mining law back, oh, it was probably about 15 years ago. A former state senator in Michigan, Tom Casperson, helped write that. And uh, uh, they uh, wrote that with the help of the Sierra Club. And it was one of the strongest mining laws in the United States. We have the same in Wisconsin and Minnesota. We believe there should be good, effective regulation, but it shouldn't be used to stop something that is so important to us in America. And uh, we all know, Ryan, that people are talking about, we got to go to the green energy route, whether it's solar panels, uh, windmills, um, electric cars, things like that. We're not going to be able to do those things 
if we don't have minerals. 7,000 pounds of copper in every one of those wind turbines that you see spinning across America. And if we're going to continue that route, as many people are advocating for, we're going to need those minerals. And why should we get them somewhere else than America, where we will do it more safely than other countries around the world, and it will provide good jobs and economic benefits for all of us in America? I 110% agree. And I was talking about that with Congressman Sauber um, a couple of weeks ago. Like, let's say, you know, in in, in the per, in a perfect world from from supporters of a Green New Deal, let's say if that does go through, there there should be a respect for where they're getting their minerals from. There should at least be a realistic understanding of where do you want these minerals to come from in the meantime? Do you want them to come from here in the U.S. or even Canada? You know, I would say Canada or the U.S. And, or, or do you want to get it from Congo? Do you want to get your cobalt? Do you still want your cobalt to be extracted by child labor, slave labor? And um, it's astonishing to me that there are many people that support the Green New Deal, but they're failing to recognize where the minerals are actually coming from. Yeah, and I think that reality is going to steadily move forward here. If we continue to move in this direction, which we're seeing uh, more and more of this happen, uh, we're going to see significant shortages of these minerals if we're not able to produce them. And um, so, I mean, people are going to have a choice. If you want to move in the route of the Green New Deal, it's going to take a lot more minerals to be able to accomplish that. And we have them here. And why shouldn't we produce them here with the tough environmental standards that we have and um, create jobs for people in Minnesota, Wisconsin, and Michigan? and create economic prosperity. You know, Ryan, to a large extent, this is no different than um, I have always talked about um, in regards to energy independence, which we, rece uh, which we achieved here in the United States. And um, what that does for us is it's job security, economic security, and it's also national security. And if people aren't concerned about China getting a lock on these minerals, they should be because China seeks global hegemony. They seek to control the world here in the 21st century. And if people don't believe it, they should sit in on our foreign policy briefings. And one of the ways you achieve that is to have dominance in regards to minerals. And right now with some of those um, um, uh, minor elements, they, uh, they do have control of that. And that could be really dangerous for America in the future for our national security.